This is your nautical lantern upon the dangerous seas of darkness. Let's push off from a placid shore of the status quo and explore what's beyond the horizon. I am your host, BT, and this is Truth and Shadow, your podcast of the supernatural. Welcome to episode one of season one, listeners. I am your host, BT, and today we're going to be talking about a topic to dive right into supernatural worldview things that's been weighing on my mind for quite a long time, probably about 20 years, and we want to talk about it and discuss it because there's more and more authors, YouTubers, podcasters talking about supernatural things that are available to listeners today, and with my personal story and my background in and history dealing with Christianity, dealing with the occult world, and my conversion to Roman Catholicism, I find it important at this time to address the supernatural worldview and bring it to light to those listeners who may otherwise not hear of it. What am I talking about with worldview? I'm talking about this issue related to angels, demons, heaven, hell. I'm talking about spirits. I'm talking about things that humans around the world through time today and all the way back to the dawn of man, have experienced, have sought to experience supernatural things, have found that the physical world seems to be co-inhabited by things that we cannot see, that there is a realm that is only separated by a thin veil. There are cultures in the world who have found certain times of the year where that veil is the thinnest. And as we're coming up, To the end of 2023, we find that this is completely true, that the world is winding down, the sun is setting earlier in the day, and it's staying dark outside for longer. It's no wonder that our ancients had found a reality and a truth in the supernatural world. I want to address a particular part of my own background and my own journey and my own conversion. This is part of my personal testimony, and I've shared it with other individuals through time, and I found it's important to talk about it and put it on the record that I find it to be true that this world is an interesting place, that there's a spiritual world, a material world, and there isn't much separating us from that. And today, we're going to talk about a couple of Bible verses. I will bring Bible in here. Talk about John chapter 10, starting at verse 22 and going through 39. And then I'm going to also talk about Psalm 82 with verse 1 and verse 6 and 7. I use the English Standard Version of the Bible. I find it to be the easiest for me to read when I am doing study and research. Listeners, you can find whatever Bible it is that you enjoy the most from literal translations like the King James or the New Revised Standard to paraphrases like the New International Version or even the Message Bible. Whatever it is that you listen to or read, it's great. Audio Bible is wonderful too. It's really nice to have somebody say it out loud to you. But what I'll do is I'll go through these Bible passages. I'll just read them as they are. I will read them no different than if you were to read it word for word. I won't stop and pontificate, which is I won't ramble on. But I do want to talk about parts of this that are important. John chapter 10 And the Gospel of John, some background here, the author of John uses the word Jews specifically to be the the opponents of Jesus. And it's important to be able to understand that in light of any other context. So when I'm reading this, I'm going to read it as it is written. And remember that John uses the word Jews to be opponents of Christ. It's important to understand that. John chapter 10, verse 22. At that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work we are going to stone you for, but blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. We read here a couple of important things. We understand that it's the Feast of the Dedication. We understand it's winter, which means between John 22 or John 10, 22 and verse 21, there's six months of time that has passed. We don't get a lot of these periods of time displacement because the way the scripture was written and given to us. However, we see that it's a specific time of the year. We understand it's a feast, specifically of dedication, and we know we're at Jerusalem. And many of us have heard some of these verses, for example, 1027 through 29, during a uh, Good Shepherd homily or service. We understand that we are the sheep of Christ in this context, if we believe in him. And these particular interlocutors are not because they're having this massive issue and they're wanting to continue to kill Jesus. They want to stone him for saying the things he's saying. I want to draw attention specifically to John 10, 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. Jesus here is quoting from a psalm, and specifically Psalm 82. In the time of Jesus, historically speaking, we didn't have verse numbers. We didn't have chapter numbers. We didn't have psalm numbers, etc., Instead, an individual would memorize, and I have no doubt in my mind that in the prayer life of Christ, he had memorized the Psalms, like many a good Jew would have done in the times. And that means he would be able to pull these ideas out and present them to his, and he would present it to his opponents in a manner that is a theological debate. He's going to bring it out. He's going to talk about it. He's going to introduce the thought. He's going to express a Judaic tradition, and he is going to use that to support his argument. This is very common among the teachers in the time of Christ. It was important for him to say these things to his audience because his audience at the time of this argument are obviously education, educated people, and he knows that it's important to draw a conclusion from the old law. He adds this traditional line, and scripture cannot be broken. That's not in the Bible verse that he quotes. He mentions that in verse 35, and scripture cannot be broken. And he mentions this to reinforce the importance of the teachings. And this brings me to explain the time period we are in. Jesus comes, and we can use uh, B.C., A.D., it doesn't matter, B.C.E. or C.E., these things don't matter. The importance is going all the way back to the second temple period, which is the period of time that scholars argue go back to 600 BC to around 70 AD, 100 AD, is a time period after the destruction of the first temple, the Babylonian exile, and a period of time where lots of things are being written down, lots of things are being discussed and argued, and people are able to have these discussions about deeper meanings within the scriptural context found in the Torah, that being the first five books of Moses, uh, namely Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And no, those are probably not in the right order. However, lots of authors in the time of this period are writing and articulating opinions, thoughts, etc., they are looking at 
the texts given in the histories, namely First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, the Book of Joshua. They're also thinking about particular arguments found in the Book of Psalms, which was the prayer book of the times and had been has been even to this day amongst the practicing Orthodox Jews and some Christian groups. If an intellectual is sitting down and having a discussion with people and writing things down, paper wasn't exactly cheap. Nobody did doodles to waste paper. It wasn't cheap to get paper. It wasn't cheap to get ink. These things cost money. Therefore, people were being serious about anything that they were going to write down. In the time of Christ, one theory that is bouncing around in the heads of some some of the individuals who live in the area is called the two powers in heaven theory. And the two powers in heaven is basically summarized as two Yahwehs. Now, any listener who understands God's name is commonly translated capital L-O-R-D in the Bible. That is a swap for the capital letters yud he vav he or Y-H-W-H from the Hebrew. This change in letters is designed to be respectful of Jewish tradition, and it's easier to read Lord than it is to read Y-H-V-H or Y-H-W-H. Okay, that's Yahweh. Some people pronounce it Yahweh, some pronounce it Yahuwah. Either way, that's not the point. How, how it's properly pronounced is not the point I'm trying to draw out here. The point is, in the time of Christ, some schools of thought believed that there were two Yahwehs in heaven. This would be, could be called the glory of God, the Shekinah, as it's found in Hebrew words. It can also be the appearance of the entity known as the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord and the glory of God are not the same thing. They're not talked about in the same fashion. So the Jews may have been muddling around and thinking about things like the Holy Spirit, but we don't get a lot of information about a Holy Spirit until the writings of the New Testament gospel writers and the things being said by Jesus, including him blowing on his apostles and telling them to receive the Holy Spirit. This means that Jews in the time were envisioning two Yahwehs, and they were thinking about this idea that there was Yahweh and then the angel of Yahweh, a different being. And they're coming to that conclusion, these two supreme powers, because Second Temple thinkers are also toying with the idea and seriously considering and believing in that once upon a time, in the great past, the ultimate Yahweh, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, he had a divine council. He had a group of beings called Elohim. God himself is an Elohim, but he is a unique, he is species unique. However, he had a divine council that was also made up of other Elohim. And this is a thought that's bouncing around the ideas in the heads of some of the Jews in Christ's time. It's bouncing around in the ideas in the heads of Christ, early Christians. You'll find things written about this in some of the church fathers. And you'll even read about it being discussed in books that have become available through the translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls and other important archaeological finds. Jesus is talking about a psalm, and I said he was talking about Psalm 82. And I'm talking about that there are other Elohim. All right, let's talk about this. Let's talk about Psalm 82. Let's talk about this divine counsel. Psalm 82, verse 1 from the ESV, once again, is, God has taken his place in the divine counsel. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Verse 6, verse 7. I said, you are God, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. This is an interesting idea. And Catholic listeners, you're going to find many who will articulate that God here is talking about 
taking his place in the synagogue, mainly amongst human beings. God is going, and he is making his presence known in the council of humans, and that this midst of gods he's in are the royal, powerful religious leaders of the people. And he calls them gods because they're the rulers, and he calls them the sons of the Most High because he, they are called to be holy. And this is going to be the argument many of you are going to hear. Now, others of you who are friends of mine and common listeners of the Divine World Council or Divine Worldview, Deuteronomy 32 Worldview, as Dr. the late Dr. Michael Heiser has talked about, is going to be very familiar with what I'm about to say. You're going to be very familiar, you're going to be close to it, and you're going to understand it. For the listener who isn't familiar, let me give you a reason why this is interesting to me. It is interesting to me because the time that this has impacted me, I'm in my mid-20s. And it's a period of darkness in my life where I had found solace in practicing dark occult magic. Before I was baptized, before I converted wholly to, to Christ, I believed that I could summon a demon, that I could summon a spirit of anything I want, that I can get what I want and have it do for me what I needed it to do as some kind of servant. And understand that wasn't true. That wasn't what was happening, even though that's what it looked like to me. That's what it looked like in my experience. I had found myself in a period of great depression, and it led me down a dark hallway in my own soul where I didn't find a whole lot of light left. There wasn't a whole lot of love left in my heart, and I really hated the world because it had failed to live up to the construction that I made it to be. And in that chaos, and in that turmoil, that inner trauma, I found a small seed that I thought I could nurture and grow and raise to maturity in the occult world. I had found that they are entities that are quite real powers that are uncomprehensible to my mind and unexplainable not because I don't know how to explain it but because there are no words used to describe the things that I have seen no language can articulate these things that haunted my life for a long time and they looked powerful and they looked like God and whenever I gazed upon it it was horrible and yet I felt that I could reach into that black inky murky water and pull out whatever I wanted whatever I desired to glean. And I understood quite well that these beings hated me. They exuded this hatred that clung to my body the way anything sticky does. Like sap. It didn't want to wash off. I couldn't get it off. And I sat in my depression, having given permissions and rights over my life to things that I didn't understand, couldn't understand, who operated with rules. that are as alien to me as anything in the deep cosmos is to any of us. It was foreign, scary. 
and I was stunned when I was demanded to worship it like a god. That I was to call it a name, that I was to burn incense or candles to it, that I was to call it forth into my life, and that I was to make it one with myself. And when I read John 10, during this time of darkness, even though reading the Bible to me was no different than reading some kind of book written by an ancient philosopher, Aristotle, Plato, what have you, no different than the journeys, the journeys of Jason and the Argonauts. It didn't matter. All of these ideas in the Bible look to me like the mythologies of Egypt, the stories of the Sumerians. They looked like so much flotsam that I was coming to grips and realizing that these spirit entities believe themselves to be gods. And they believed that I would be harmed or hurt if I didn't worship them. That I didn't do my own dark liturgy. And that's where I found myself. I found myself sitting alone. I had no more friends because I didn't speak to anyone. I didn't do well with money because I spent it buying stupid, impulsive things that I was told to buy in my mind. Now, mind you, it was like some kind of weird inspiration. I was inspired to buy this or that stone or crystal, to buy this or that candle. And here I sat reading the Bible because of some kind of dimly low-lit lantern in some darkened corner of my soul. I opened it up, and it fell, actually open to John chapter 10. And yeah, I read, Jesus is the good shepherd. I got that. That's not where my eyes fell. My eyes fell on the unique personhood of Christ. Jesus Christ was equating himself with God. He was calling himself God. And if he's calling himself one with the Father, one in being, consubstantial, if you will, of the same substance, and then he calls the Jews that are arguing with him gods, he's saying something very weird. And for a little while, I believe that Jesus was an ordinary man. And I believe that he was an ordinary man because of the way this is argued. Here Jesus is saying, look, I am the Father or one, and I do the works of God the Father, and it's written in, in your law that you're God's, and so I can say I am the Father or one, and so can you. You can say that you are in the Father or one, because we're all in one. God is in us, God is in the tree, God is in the ground, God is in the sky, God is panentheistic, and that's troublesome. Because that's not what Jesus is saying at all. He is arguing three points. And when you argue in threes, there's something very particularly important being said. They didn't have those words really. But you got to really listen to this. I'm going to say it three times. It's very important. And Jesus says, look, in your law, in your book of Psalms, in your book of prayer, would you pray? God sits in his divine council and I'm there. I'm in that council because I am one with the Father, and the Father is one with me, and that there was a divine council once upon a time, and they were once called gods. All right, so Jesus is double, tripling down on the fact that he and the Father is one. Okay, I'm going to hear many people who will argue and say, no, that's not what's going on at all, and that's okay. What I'm going to say, and I'm going to take a little bit of time right now and be specific I am going to argue and talk about a couple of points here, and I want people to listen and talk about it. Talk about it with yourselves. Talk about it with people that you know. Talk about it with me. You can use my Facebook group, Truth and Shadow. It's on Facebook. Psalm 82, verse 1, God has taken his place in the divine council, 
In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And I'm going to talk about this because this first occurrence, this word God, is Elohim, singular. In the midst of the gods, plural. These words are taken as singular or plural because of Hebrew grammar, not because of how it's read. When we read it in English, we do see that God, singular, midst of the gods, plural. Well, that's how the translators put it down. And the translators are not wrong. They're not substituting this word Elohim for man. They're translating it as it is, as it is in the Hebrew. And it's plural because of this subject-verb agreement. And the subject-verb agreement is divine assembly. The verb, divine assembly, God's subject. One cannot be in the midst of the one. One cannot be in the midst of one. So basically anybody who believes that God has taken his place in the Trinity, that doesn't make any sense. You cannot be in the midst of one. You have to be in the midst of others. And it would lead to a weird heretical statement. But the grammar here and the syntax are quite clear. The God of Israel is presiding over a group, a council of Elohim. And they're going to suffer the loss of their immortality. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. If God is talking about men here, men die. Princes fall. Divine gods, they don't do that. But here, God is taking away their immortality and he's making them into mortals. He is going to let them die and fall. The issue is, how can that be? How can an Israelite writing this down or translating it or giving it to us as we have it today in the midst of Israelite monotheism say, hey, there are a couple of different things going on. There is a plurality here. There is a divine council. I mean, we're talking about a world view that should be monotheistic. But this is the reason why when anyone asks this question about this particular verse, many are going to, either Jewish or Christian, are going to say that these are humans. And seeing them as Elohim, as divine beings, is a threat to monotheism. It's not, because we worship God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and the earth, and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. We don't worship the divine council no matter in my personal life, if they wanted me to worship them. The dark spirits, the dark entities that I could not comprehend, very well could have been the spirits of these things sent to die. The fact alone, this word Elohim, should immediately and unambiguously tell us that the word Elohim shouldn't be identified with one particular set of attributes. That's what I'm saying. When we read the, the word Elohim and we say that it means this trinity every time we read it, that we translate it as God, singular, that it is those particular set of attributes, this is a fundamental mistake. And it's a fundamental mistake not merely because a personal experience has told me and shown me that these things are real, that they're out there, and that they manifest themselves when we dabble a little too deeply in the water. They're like sharks ready to bite because we're acting like seals on the surface, we need to understand that of all the times the word Elohim is mentioned in the Bible, it is talking about beings that do not inhabit human world. They do not inhabit the material plane. Elohim are not part of nature in the world of humankind. But the idea that we are subject and beholden to the 17th century creation of the word monotheism is an error in thought. Ultimately, when we read John 10 and we find verse 34, 35, and that we read Psalm 82, 1 or 6 and 7, that we have nothing to fear from letting the scriptures say what they say. It says this, as plainly as it can be, in the language it was written in, the language that we get it today, it is what it is from the original autographs that have been lost to the sands of time. 
we no more need to fear this potential idea that we're going to fall into some trap of polytheism, that we're suddenly in a religion of multiple gods. That's not what it is at all. Christianity worships one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And the Nicene Creed says that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. And it's important to stress that today, because in the midst of this worldview, in the midst of the influences and dark, sinister forces that have been lurking no more in the shadows, but have come out to play, it is important for us to talk about it today so that we may have the proper weapons and the tools and the armor to protect ourselves from these dark and troubled times. We could no longer ignore the powers of darkness. We can no longer pretend as if they do not exist. We can no longer live in ignorance. I think it's time for us to push off from the shore of conformity, push out into the waters that we may cross the water, regardless of the roiling seas, the winds that may smash upon us. But I think it's time that we take our lanterns and that we go forth out of this placid worldview and join me in these episodes as I talk about this worldview, this supernatural existence of things, as I discuss Bigfoot, ghouls, zombies, angels, and demons. They talk about all of these things and more. Thank you for listening. This is a free podcast and is based upon the value for value model. If you find value in this or any episode, you can return that value by liking the show, leaving a review, sharing with a friend on your social medias. You can also donate on my website, Thank you again. This is BT for Truth and Shadow Podcast. You are the light and the darkness.